Ask Alex. Ask Alex. Because you don't know what you don't know. And if you don't know, now you know. Yeah. Zach, why don't you tell me what, what you're working on and the, the problems you're facing right now? Yeah, so the uh, company was launched about a year ago. You know, obviously, super viral product uh, went really well. You know, we spent uh, two mil at a 4X on Facebook, which was wonderful. Um, became a Facebook case study. And then once, once January hit, all of a sudden, we had a team of 60. And wow. no real ability in it no real ability to generate revenue. I mean, the story of that in and of itself was a little chaotic. You know, we failed to deliver about 100,000 orders before Christmas. So we, uh, you know, we built three different manufacturing facilities in the U.S. We chartered a plane for a month to be flying people between them, you know, our management team. Uh, It was, it was, it was, it was nuts. I, so a a brief little, uh, (laughs) <laughs> tidbit there so during all this time um you know we had we had completely run out of socks and you can't print on cotton socks you can only supplement on polyester mm-hmm. and uh, polyester socks are generally not produced in any kind of real volume because cotton is cheaper more comfortable um, a better material in in most contexts so the reason we got into this whole mess is because in october i told my my partner I want to do $5 million over Christmas. And we had done probably $300,000 the month before. And he uh, you know, thought he was being very, very clever in not buying that kind of inventory. So that come January, he would have said, aren't you so glad you, you know, we only did a million bucks and I didn't buy $5 million of inventory. Um, but we ended up doing eight and he had enough inventory for less than one. So we completely ran out. And it's, you know, we're, we're sourcing batches of like 3,000 pairs here, 5,000 pairs here. I mean, we had, we had a quarter million pairs sold. And uh, so we ran out completely. And I had a trip to Europe planned after Christmas because I said, oh, by this point, you know, there's going to be nothing to do. Um, so I'll go. And we were completely out of socks. So my team and I, we sat down and it's like, guys, there's, there's nothing we can do right now other than answer customer service emails. I had a team of almost 30 people doing that. So I said, you know, I'll go take my trip. Well, uh, made the mistake of posting a photo on Instagram. And I didn't realize the angry mob that was developing because everyone <laughs> did not consider that it was just a company running behind, even though we sent out tons of emails and sent out videos from our production facilities, like try demonstrating that we were the real deal. Yeah. Um, Everyone just thought we were a group of scammers. And so the story became, you know, this 23-year-old scammer just took all your money, ran to Europe, and let's put it on nine major news networks um, as the Grinch that stole Christmas. Oh. It, was, uh, it, was, it was quite an adventure. And, and so, you know, I, I, I came back to find, a, you know, a, a news station outside of our Atlanta office. And, you know, to this day, like, I can send links to where they're like, here he is in front of the Mona Lisa with, you know, ill-gotten profits selling fake uh, Christmas gifts. <laughs> so, which, I'm not sure how, um, how a $5,000 trip to Europe um, that I planned a year before really had uh, that much bearing on uh, on that, but you know, neither here nor there. So yeah, but what's out for that? There's a couple of examples of startups who, you know, got money not necessarily doing amazing, and the founders are like lollygagging around with hot girls and posting on Instagram. And then well, when I, I kind of felt like the Juno guy, guy in Burning Man. Yeah, you remember that? Yeah, the the. I mean, I I felt I, I remember I was laughing at him a year ago, and then I became him. Yeah. Yeah, you know? um, <laughs> that's so bad. But yeah, so you know, we had uh, we had tens of thousands of emails to work through in uh, in January. Uh, the dilemma then became, you know, we had this big team, so and, and you know, several manufacturing facilities. So we launched uh, something called Bay Socks. Put your put your bay on socks. So it was a Valentine's Day push. Yeah. Um, you know, and it was it was. It was a process to to try and eke out, you know, Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, Father's Day. So now all that's done. And 
I'm in this position where um, I don't really see a trajectory for this company becoming beyond, you know, this Christmas push. I mean, off peak, like it's super hard to maintain a positive return on ad spend. And there is a core novelty to this product where it doesn't lend itself to a particularly high LTV. Mm -hmm. We have customers who order a pair or two pairs Mm -hmm. and that's sort of it. You know, we have a 25% repurchase rate Mm -hmm. and you know, that's already now a year and you know, it's like a classic, I mean, any business problem, but like we're watching it happen with Blue Apron, LTV's not moving, CPA yeah. keeps climbing, so here we are. Um, and that's the struggle. So fundamentally, you got a CAC LTV. Do you have a CAC LTV problem? Is your one-time purchase rate sufficient or 1.25, whatever the average is, sufficient to cover your acquisition cost? It system. is currently um, not, not off-peak or at scale. Uh, um, I mean, look, look, right now we can run ad campaigns at like a one four or one five. It's not super profitable. We can only spend a couple thousand bucks. Um, you know, there's, there's no scale there. Now, during the holidays, look, we have national TV launching. We have uh, another hopefully good year of paid social ahead of us and so on and so forth. But fundamentally, when, when you look at it, I mean, we haven't raised any capital, so it's, it's not as if I'm beholden to anyone. But there's there's no real exit here, especially for a business that, I mean, even if it does have a three, four, five million dollar EBITDA, which is hopefully we'll have, uh, what am I going to get? Three X maybe at, at, at best. There's, there's, there's no long term strategy here or anything that at least I've been able to identify um, as a path to real scale. Well, let's plan this out here, for example. So, I mean, you've got a bait and hook here that you have something which engages with people, they think it's funny, and then they buy it, right? So I presume conversion rates are decent. Uh, just under 10%. Yeah, so that's pretty good, right? I mean, well, for e-commerce, it's for any kind of um, commerce is brilliant. Um, I mean, you know, a lot of people would have like one, one-ish percent. Sure. So 10% is astounding. So once you get those customers, can you do something more with them? Like, are there additional things that you could be selling to them? So, you know, okay, fine, they're doing printing on, you know, potential itchy, whatever, polyester socks or something. But you've identified, you've identified these people. Like, can you sell them other things? Can you sell them normal socks? Could you cross sell and do something else? Um, you know, what can you do once you have all these customers? Like, can so you make more money? the issue really is that they're buying a gift, right? Yeah. Uh, if they were ordering it for themselves, which is less than a third of the customers, yeah. uh, this might be a, a clearer thing. But when you're buying for your aunt who's obsessed with her dog, yeah. we know have you as a customer, but yeah. we don't have a real way of parlaying that into continued sales. What we have done and has worked really, really well is we've built this engine that takes all of the uploaded images and all of our print-ready files because we have to clip out the head and mm-hmm. you know, template it and render that on new products and send that out at, you know, in mass. So if we have, you know, 200,000 customers, every single customer is getting a different personalized email of our products rendered with whatever photo they had originally uploaded. Yeah. That is just murderous. I mean, that, that did really, really well over a 50% open rate, like a 27% CTR. It was, mm-hmm. it was, nuts. but again, there's only so much you can juice out of that. Because ultimately, you know, I mean, how, like, you know, one issue is like, well, how many people have photos of people that they could use, right? This is a starting point, maybe. But then how many times do you want to be gifting stuff? Because you're not going to give Aunt Tess, like, the picture of her dog on a T-shirt for Christmas the next year because it's sort of the same thing, right? People want to have some novelty in what they're doing. So if you're just doing that, then you need to increase the number of people who buy gifts for people and stick pictures on them um i don't know what the stats on for how many people actually buy presents for people anymore but i can sure as hell tell you for all my friends parties like no one is buying birthday presents for anyone or if if it is it's just a bottle of vodka or something right um so you need to tap into a way to expand i guess your mind share of people 
Maybe it could be a different category of business. Maybe there's like ancillary things that you can be doing, like, I don't know, like flogging your database and cross selling for BarkBox. Right. If you know people are dog lovers, but again, I don't know how much money that fundamentally makes you. Right. Correct. Um, That's sort of the problem. I can juice up, I can juice up probably 20%, I think. Um, you know, can I get some affiliate offers in? Probably. Can I make an extra 10, 20, 30 bucks, maybe even? Sure. Maybe. I don't know. Um, but, you know, it's, it's figuring out how to turn, turn the personalization, you know, to something far beyond that. Because, look, if, if you can't, if you can't significantly raise LTV, like over time, mm-hmm. CAC will go, period, right? Yeah, of course. So, Which is funny because most founders model that the CAC goes down. <laughs> well, it's not realistic. It's not, it's not the case. Especially, look, when, when, you, when you have a $100,000 ad budget, yeah, you can pick and choose some, some great places to put it. But if you need to figure out how to spend $10 million or $100 million, yeah, that's not going to be very efficient. You end up on TV and radio and stuff, right? Where you've got no attribution. Which, yeah, somehow, you know, Hims is managing that. I don't know if, if uh, you have the same thing in the UK, but Hims right now is just destroying the US market. Like every six commercial is a Hims. What's Hims? Um, mail, effectively, it's like. Oh, it's like, someone it's mentioned it the other day. Okay, go on. Please explain. Yeah. Or Hims.com. So uh, effectively, yeah. They're trying to turn like skincare, hair care, yeah. self care into yeah. a, a large category for men, which probably needed to be done a long time ago. And they're they're gunning it at mm. at some pretty staggering rates. I, I can't imagine, you know, how much they're spending. I don't even see how much they've raised. But yeah, it's just inefficient. It, it has to be. So that's sort of uh, the thing is. So- we- that is that you end up with the recurring purchases, right? Because they're disposable yeah, products. The they can justify it, right? Like if, if someone if someone's ordering four or five pairs of socks and spending a hundred to one hundred fifty dollars a year, this would be a moot point. Even if I even if I spend a hundred dollars on the CAC, it's like, eh, it'll come back next year. I'm okay with it. Yeah. Um, but that but, may not be the case. In which case, you need to make it on a one-time purchase, right? Exactly right. Which is also so, not. Well, world's best thing doing, because you, you fundamentally chime through the whole market eventually right absolutely yeah i mean ultimately you need to figure out some uh, new line of products to sell yeah we've pushed into uh into books and we've put or not books uh blankets shoes uh mugs that kind of thing those do pretty well it's still a race to zero there mm. um, we, we have polled our customers as to whether they would want a subscription of yeah. some kind. And that got mixed results. Uh, probably 25% said they, they would be, you know, and, and they had a lot of desired, you know, use cases for, for how they would use that. I mean, fundamentally, I don't, I don't know how in the gift industry this is managed. I mean, Brookstone it just filed for bankruptcy. Have they? Interesting. Yeah, their their e-com unit is apparently doing quite well. And I actually, yeah. um, I saw the VP of e-com at Brookstone and, and had a similar conversation with him last week. But gifting is changing. And, and, it, and if it really is a race to zero or the intersection of, of CAC and LTV, then it is a question of, you know, does this business yeah. get sold next year? But, you know, but ultimately, like every single company is just a mousetrap. And if you can have lower CAC and higher LTV, then you've built a better mousetrap. But that's all startup is. It doesn't matter what you do. It's like how much do you get people from and how much do you make from them? And ideally, the payback time on that as well, right? Correct, exactly. So self funds, you know, you make, you make one, you, you, you buy for one, you sell for two, and you've got $2 to buy two customers, right? Um, and so if your payback time is, ha- is faster, then, you know, you basically effectively have like a viral factor on it. Um, but it, how much money you're making from these people is a determine of your business. And also, I guess, a function of like how big of the business do you want to build? Because if you can have a nice business recurring, making $4 million a year, then that's fantastic. If you want to get on the fundraising route, then that doesn't really work, right? Correct. Yeah, and then there's no real scale. I mean, we've done what we can do. 
Mm. And, and I, look, that's it's not at all to trivialize that kind of money. And that's great. I'm, I'm really proud to have brought this business to that point. But uh, the other issue too is there's a multiple question here. Look, if I had a $4 million bottom line in a SaaS product, we'd be talking about maybe even a hundred million dollar exit. Mm. Uh, if, <laughs> if we're talking about a company with declining revenues or a rise, you know, a rapidly rising CAC, I might, I might not get one X. Yeah. Um, I mean, one, one obvious factor is geography because you're only us focused, right? No, we, we've done a lot of business in the UK and Australia, at least, uh, this past Christmas. So we expect, we expect that to go well next year. Uh, Australia alone accounted for almost 15% of our sales last uh, Christmas. So it was, it was pretty significant. The UK was another 5%, which, you know, on a per capita basis is a pretty decent chunk of our, of our You've business. got, you know, you've got Germany and France and, you know, like a whole host of countries. I mean, you have to do different languages and stuff, but, you know, geographic-wise, there's probably a lot of headroom. It's still going to face the same yeah. issues, but you can still bring the number, the absolute number bigger. Correct. Yeah. And that's, and that's really where we're going now. I mean, it was $8 million. Like this year we're shooting for 20, mm-hmm. but that, that 20 won't be nearly as efficient. I mean, we, we might make the same dollars. Um, but, you know, as far as, as far as the utility of, of this discussion for, mm-hmm. you know, you and, 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 mm-hmm. and the people that follow you, I think, I think it really does, um, you know, beg the question of, the role of LTV, and I think that's something that is is really overlooked by a lot of mm. founders. And I mean, frankly, if you go and if you go and tell me your LTV, right? If, mm. if you can if you can justify the value of this customer over time, you can pretty readily just from that metric alone understand this scale and opportunity of a business. A lot of people don't don't realize that. You know, it's. Starbucks is able to be what Starbucks is because they have a wonderfully sticky business and they have a 10 year LTV of $14,000. And so if you're sitting in Starbucks' marketing department wondering how to acquire customers, you can spend a thousand bucks, two thousand bucks, three thousand bucks. And you have so many founders who are fighting trying to find cheaper customers, ignoring the fact that that's not really the answer. Mm. It's It's about creating more value. Yeah. Um, I mean, so look, ultimately, if you're staying, there's a couple of things you can do, but ultimately, if you're staying with what you're doing, which is, I don't know, comical, whimsy, gifting products, right? Then your market size is basically going to be determined by number of lines that you have, number of geographies that you're fundamentally addressing, I guess. So I guess one thing you could think is, you know what, maybe if this is a loser, then squeeze out as much cash as you can and use that to bankroll your next venture, which, you know, it's not exactly the, the typical thing to say, but why not, you know? That's exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, and then that's where, you know, it's a, it's a good academic discussion to have about you know, how can you try to push this further? And, you know, we have some ideas on that. Mm-hmm. Um, we are not far from, from deploying tech that will, actually bring you to our site, ask you to upload a photo, we'll intelligently recognize the dog head and then render that photo yeah. across our entire catalog in, in real time. Yeah. So it's something that hasn't really been done before. And, yeah, we're, yeah. and, it'll, be, and it'll be helpful. Yeah. You know, it, it doesn't, doesn't solve our core issue. I mean, the other thing that we've done is launched a separate brand called Face Socks. So... Face socks are now being worn off in a, at a gay pride parades because, you know, we have like rainbow designs or, you know, we have specific like best dad in the world, which is, you know, a whole line for Father's Day. And, yeah. and this, um, we see a similar effect there where we don't really have true scale in, in non-peak buying times. Like our back to school designs are not exactly doing well. Kids, socks, kids could be interesting, I guess. I mean, they might wear them regularly, right? I guess it depends on the differential pricing between what you charge and what retail would be, right? If you go into a store. Correct. Uh, so they could yeah. be, yeah. We're launching retail on, on that too. Um, so we have 
about 200 doors committed for you know Q1 of 19, which sounds like a lot, but it, it's really not. And so, what is, what are you? Are you a printing business? Like your core competency, you know, if you come from that point of view. Uh, I wouldn't say so. I, I, I would say that we are uh, an e-com company, uh, an internet marketing company, which is not exactly the most valuable place you want to be because that too is always a race to zero. Mm. But, but, you know, it's trying to leverage tech. I mean, look, we're really, really good at operating things at scale. Um, mm. whether, you know, be they ad campaigns or the back end, listen, ingesting, ingesting and clipping a quarter million images, even if we were a little late in, in 30 days and building up our team rapidly is like the, like the core startup yeah. you know, journey. And uh, we've done that well, yeah. well, for a business that, that doesn't have a long term viability. Because like one way of thinking about this. Because like I, I'm not going to be able to give you any silver bullet in this system, and that's like the hard thing about hard things, right? Is but if you think about your core competencies, like how can you reapply them? So like if you're a manufacturer, you're like, okay, we've developed a lot of expertise in how we can be agile and do lean manufacturing or whatever it is. How could we reapply that to maybe completely different verticals? You know, I don't know, like printing football shirts, jerseys for teams or something, or you know, like how you know maybe something very different like how you play that. If you're saying, well, look, we're, you know, we know how to scale and build startups and we're very good at marketing. It's a little bit harder, but then it could be, you know, do we have to just do printing? Can we just not find any kind of opportunity which leverages our core capabilities and launch more verticals? And then, you know, I, if they can be somewhat related to your customers, then you, you have a free database, right? So in a way you could almost use, you know, Facebook, et cetera, as a low cost acquisition channel and apply that to maybe a better better vertical with higher LTV. I mean, maybe you could build a SaaS company out of it. For, I don't know. I, I'm making this all up. You get what I mean? If you think yeah. about your core competencies, how could you reapply those? Uh, so actually that's a really, that's a really good point. Um, it kind of sparked an idea there for me mm. that uh, I think might really work. You know, of our core customers, everyone is giving Christmas gifts, or most of them are giving Christmas mm. gifts. We, you know, it's still 90 plus percent of our business over the, over the trailing 12 months. So diving deeper into Christmas is a really interesting opportunity because there's a lot of things you can do there. And there are a lot of gifting opportunities there. And I have I have an idea that before, you know, before I share it, I I want to go and yeah. take it out a little bit, but that's that's a really, really good, really, really good way of looking at it. Because it's like, a, like maybe if we define it as the market for customization, because like, I don't know, I bought my sister some silver trinket thing for a Christmas tree, right? And then, you know, you make a little bit of effort and it's like, you know, dear Rebecca, you know, Merry Christmas or whatever. But that's a customization, right? And right. so like the category of gifting can be vastly expanded you know, maybe you have a site which is you can intelligently figure out, put in some factors. Okay, his name's Alex. He's 35. He lives in London. He likes playing rugby and he likes computers and he likes something. And it could be like, here are the list of all the best gifts that you could buy someone of that profile. And then, you know, your value out of differentiation could also be that you customize it or something. Actually, that is a much more exciting value proposition, especially at scale. Because if you can, if you can be really effective at that um even even just do it as like a you know concierge play at first where we have people on the mm -hmm. back end you know curating all of the offerings then at scale you gather up enough data um you know if you can use predictive ai and analytics to determine in advance quite frankly what you may be able to do totally you know imaginary world here but if if you can go and link into someone's facebook activity you can probably learn enough about them to know what kind of gifts they would like. Yeah, but you won't get access to third parties. You'll get access to my Facebook profile, but you won't get access to my feed unless you're Cambridge Analytica and you did this back in 2010 or something, right? Yeah, I actually got a chance to see Nick speak a couple of weeks before everything broke. 
Mm. And I'm not sure if you have interacted with him or, or no. watched anything, um, but it was to a room of 300 people and it was silent. Mm. I mean, you could have heard a pin drop. And everyone walked away from it being like, that dude's an evil genius. <laughs> like that, like that is the closest anyone has ever come to like actual, like terrifying cartoon, like, you know, because he, he just stands there and he's like, we track everyone at every time and we use it. We've overthrown dictators and we, <laughs> you know, cause that's, that's what, that's what they did for 20 years before they, before they got into social, they had a consulting agency yeah. and they were, they had major contracts with the department of defense in the U S and they were, you know, he, um, he says something brilliant that uh, that I thought was just great. He goes, uh, you know, most people, if they want to sell more soda in a movie theater, they put up advertising. They, you know, try to offer upsells. They offer packages and bundles. They put up billboards, whatever. He goes, not me. I just turned up the temperature in the theater. And and uh, I went, wow, this, this dude's nuts. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Occam's razor, you know, the simplest solution. Um, but yeah, I, you know, but it's good that you're thinking about these things and not just being like, you know, party time or making money, but actually just genuinely about how to build a bigger business. But it's, um, you know, what, what I really think is important for founders, it, it, for actual entrepreneurs, I don't mean like bankers who hate banking and start a company because everyone thinks it's cool these days, right? But if you're a proper founder, then you have a shelf life of how many, of how long you're going to do this for, and also how many startups you'll ever actually do. And so what you're doing now should be looked at through the lens of, do I have a better ROI to spend on something else or not? Um, especially if you have options. Um, so if there are better things to do, then you should actually take that you know, seriously. So I've had a couple of calls of people and I basically told them like, your business doesn't work. You should drop it and do basically anything else. Um, you don't quite have that problem, but you know, it's you still have an ROI in your time. If you could be doing right. something else, then maybe just you know consider doing that. Well, I, I think it's you know deciding on what one expects out of their you know life of the of the mm. preceding five, ten, fifteen years, right? Um, so you know, for me, I I want more and bigger, mm. and that doesn't necessarily even have to come from a financial perspective mm. so it's good um but there's 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 no major gratification in selling dog loan socks which, which might come as a surprise to most people but uh it, you know it it's it's fun it's 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 nice to make people happy and it, you know we give back to the humane society and, and another local charity here so you know these things are positively impacting um in the world in some way but I think, I think you're right. I also think people have, you know, a real inability to understand what a sunk cost is yeah. and not what this business is, but certainly I can imagine you, you face a lot of people who have spent years or a lot of money or both chasing after something that. Yeah, like, but I even have, I had this one guy in America being like, he's building a business like Groupon. I'm like, dude, like, that's just so over. Yeah. Like you're just, you're just wasting your time, you know? Um, okay. And like realizing that or just actually then actioning on that is hard. Whereas if you're actually making good money, I bet the, dis the, the decision to actually kill a startup which is making money must be very hard. Well, it, you know, it's, uh, it's a wind down process, but the hard thing, but hard things, there are, there are much harder things to deal with than, uh, you know, we're making good money, but there are, you know, the grass is greener somewhere else. Doesn't make it an easy decision to make, but no. but it's a lot less painful, I think, than we're not making any money. We're dead, and we're dead. Yeah, but look, you, you know, you have a lot of you have options, right? You have you've built a platform which you can leverage, and you can basically innovate in any way that you choose because you're making enough cash to play around with it, right? Correct. Right. Um, and if you actually you know, as you said, if you, if you, if you went for like to say 10 million as opposed to 20 million with the lower CAC, you may be able to have lower head count, et cetera, which means that you can juice up the amount of cash you're making. Um, and look at how you want to reinvest that into something. 
Well, um, you know, I mean, like this, this total bullshit idea, but like, for example, if you're figuring out how to automate, you know, focusing onto whatever a face image and you can remove everything else out, like if that text kind of interesting, you know, could you turn that into a SaaS company? I don't know if you can, I'm just, you know, as an idea or as, right. as if you've been building your business, have you gone, oh, do you know what? Like if someone had built that, I totally would have bought that from them. And so long as there's a lot of people doing that, then that could be interesting. Yeah, I mean, which really lends itself to kind of the nature of a startup in general, right? You know, it's it's not even so much the idea because so many things get sprung from it. I mean, Slack is like the yeah. you know, post-child example of that. Yeah. And, and that that's something that we certainly can look at. I mean, is there enough utility at scale? Do the ends justify the means, the juice worth the squeeze? I, I don't know. But but you're absolutely right. For 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 me, I think that I, I think that there are a lot of good uh, directions that even just on, on our call that have, have come to mind, mm. and I I would love to update you in the next few weeks as I yeah that'd be cool to test them. yeah let me know how you get on but yeah I mean like you've got opportunity it's just it, I think it's just going to be hard but I guess ultimately you just need to pick something and then learn how to live with it. You can always change it again, but you know. Well, that's uh, that's the task at hand. All right, all right, Zach. It was very nice talking with uh, with you. Absolutely, Alex. Thanks.